For more than a hundred thousand years, humans left their original spawn point on the African continent and set out on the greatest odyssey of exploration ever yet known. The discovery of the rest of our planet. Slowly over the eons, our ancestors spread first to Western Asia, then to Southeast Asia and Australia, and then to Europe gradually expanding from these areas to the rest of Eurasia until, at the continent's edge, they pushed over into North America and South America from there. Over the next thousands of years, the ancient Polynesians reached out across the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and discovered countless islands that mankind had never once before laid eyes upon. During the European Age of Discovery, many more scattered islands across the world's vast oceans that had never before been witnessed by us were finally found culminating in the final discovery of our planet's last and most difficult to reach continent, Antarctica, first observed by humans only in 1820. For the next century, the heroic age of Antarctic exploration saw humans exploring the final continent our species had to discover. And today, the frozen continent is home to thousands of people and we, as a species, are the only ones who have ever found and settled all seven of the planet's continents all on our own. And then, suddenly, after eons of time leading up to the 20th century, there was no more land left to be discovered. Every continent and every island had been found and mapped and the world as we knew it was growing smaller and better understood. The age of discovering our planet's surface was finally at an end. But the era of human discovery and exploration of the unknown did not end. In truth, it had only just begun. For humanity, if anything, is infinitely curious. During the summer of 1944, as the world was on fire, the next step in human exploration began when the Germans blasted off MW18014 from near the Baltic Sea, a rocket that became the first man-made object to ever enter outer space. And ever since then, mankind's thirst for knowledge and exploration has turned away from our own planet and towards those above in our skies. Thousands of satellites have been placed into orbit around our Earth. Twelve men have landed on and set foot on our moon. We've landed advanced robotic rovers on Mars that are scouring the planet as we speak for signs of life. And still, we've only just begun. Because if everything goes according to plan, this decade, the 2020s, will become the greatest and the most influential decade in the entire history of human exploration going back more than 100,000 years. And these are all of the many reasons why. I'm going to begin by talking about India, the newest nation to have entered humanity's space race. While well, India has been launching satellites and other probes out into the great beyond for a couple of decades now already, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, is finally now at the precipice of human spaceflight as well which is an incredibly important milestone. What only just began in 2007, the Indian Human Spaceflight Program has been working on its first crewed orbital spacecraft for over a decade now, known as Ganganyaan, or Skycraft. This 3.7-ton spacecraft has a crew capacity of three people and is expected to launch atop the already proven GSLV Mark III launch vehicle and carry the first Indian crew into orbit just next year in 2023. But prior to this eventual mission, there's a lot of work still left to do because there are two unmanned test flights that need to be made first in order to prove that the launch vehicle works properly. During all of these flights, the spacecraft will launch from Satish Dhawan Space Center on India's southeastern coast before reaching an orbit of nearly 400 kilometers above the planet, which is comfortably within what's known as low Earth orbit, or LEO, or basically anything that is beneath 2,000 kilometers. Then, after zooming around the Earth for a few days, the spacecraft will deorbit and splash down comfortably within the Bay of Bengal to complete its mission, cementing India's place as one of only four countries worldwide with the capability to launch its own people into space, along with Russia, the United States, and China. Speaking of which, brings us on to the next major mission of the 2020s, the new and improved Chinese space station known as Tiangong. 
When completed, this will become the third Chinese space station in recent decades, following Tiangong-1 and Tiangong-2, which lasted for six and a half and five years each, respectively. But the key difference here is that this time, Tiangong is planned to last for the long term, and finally give China a permanent presence in space, which is something that they haven't been able to achieve since being banned from the current International Space Station ever since 2011, when the United States government passed a new law that blocked any American contacts with the Chinese space program because out of national security concerns. Effectively, this has meant that for the past decade, NASA has not been allowed to work with the Chinese space program in any capacity. Which is why China is building their own station and have been rapidly expanding their own spaceflight capabilities. As of September 2021, the Chinese have launched their own astronauts into space, becoming only the third nation to ever do so after the Soviets and the Americans, and completed 18 missions, all without a single astronaut fatality. They've already gotten the first module of the Tiangong station into orbit, and the plan is to launch the remaining modules later on this year, in 2022. Once completed, Tiangong will be about one-fifth the size of the current ISS and be capable of carrying up to three crew members at any given time. But this station isn't the end of China's ambitions in space this decade. Perhaps a little overambitiously, China and Russia have both declared that, right now, they plan to establish a jointly controlled Sino-Russian base on the surface of the Moon's South Pole by 2027 eight years earlier than their previously targeted date of 2035, and only five years from now. If this ends up actually being successful, it'll establish the potential for the very first Chinese and Russian astronauts setting foot on the lunar surface, and it will greatly accelerate the global space race in the later half of this decade. Because obviously, China and Russia are not alone with their lunar ambitions. Besides for the goals of nation-states, there are also the goals of private corporations this time around as well. Among them is Jeff Bezos' private space company Blue Origin, which he is currently spending $1 billion a year of his own capital supporting. By the end of the decade in 2030, Blue Origin's most ambitious goal announced so far is the construction of a private space station in low Earth orbit that they're calling Orbital Reef. Designed to support up to 10 people at a time with a complete full-service luxury hotel on board, the space station is largely intended to become the premier destination for ultra-wealthy tourists who are enthusiastic about space, complete with massive windows overlooking the Earth, all while experiencing weightlessness. Prices for tickets to the station have yet to be publicly disclosed, but are likely to be somewhere in the neighborhood of the tens of millions of dollars. And then there's Elon Musk Musk's company, SpaceX. Having already launched nearly 150 missions to space now, including resupplying the International Space Station, regularly landing their first stage boosters, and even launching a car into orbit, SpaceX retains a hefty $100 billion valuation and is certainly the most accomplished of all the private space companies. And fittingly, their goals for this decade are certainly also the most ambitious. Their newest rocket currently under design and construction construction is called Starship. Designed to be 100% fully reusable, the largest rocket ever created will be capable of blasting off a hundred tons of payload into orbit at a time, which is about the same as the entire mass of the Tiangong space station under construction by China. One of Starship's first planned missions this decade is codenamed Dear Moon, conceived of and paid for by Japanese billionaire Yusaku Meizawa to take himself and eight of his friends on an unforgettable journey completely around the moon and back to Earth. Pending the success of an unmanned mission around the moon first, the Starship is expected to take him on this journey no earlier than 2023. But of course, this is really only the beginning of SpaceX's ambitions this decade. Elon Musk has set his entire company's ambitions on the colonization of Mars, and as of October 2020, he has named the year 2024 as the primary goal for first landing an uncrewed mission using Starship on the Red Planet. Planet. Just two years after that in 2026, and only four years from now, the plan, as it exists now, is to finally land the first set of humans on Mars, and usher in the era of humanity becoming, for the very first time, an interplanetary species. The culmination of all our species' hard work and discoveries ever since we first left the African continent more than 100,000 years ago. 
After the first landings of people, SpaceX intends to get an actual, self-sustainable city going on the Martian surface by around 2050. Elon Musk's ambitions for Mars this decade have been very well publicized already, but landing people on that planet is far from their only plans. They're also using Starship in collaboration with NASA to put humans back on the moon by 2025, within just three years from now, as part of the Artemis program. Envisioned by NASA with a $35 billion budget, the Artemis program right now plans to return humans back to the moon at the lunar south pole by 2025 which, if successful, will be the first crewed mission to the moon in more than half a century since the last one in 1972. And this time, it will include landing the first woman and the first person of color on the moon's surface. By the end of the 2020s, NASA plans to further establish a more permanent base camp on the moon's surface that will be capable of supporting crewed missions for up to two months and will be built out further over the next several decades. But NASA has has many, many more exciting plans this decade beyond just returning humans to the moon. There's also Dragonfly, a very ambitious NASA plan to land a robotic rotorcraft on the surface of Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. Expected to launch from Earth in 2027, this machine will become the first aircraft to ever fly on any moon, and it will be capable of using vertical takeoffs and landings to quickly move between different exploration sites of interest on Titan's surface, while it searches for any signs of life that may be there. Titan itself is highly unique, as it is the only moon that is known Known to have a dense atmosphere, and the only known moon or planet other than our own Earth where there is clear evidence of stable bodies of liquid on the surface, and with geographic features like rivers, lakes, and seas. Though, on Titan, these bodies of liquid are likely made out of methane and not water. However, the surface of Titan is extremely carbon-rich and dominated by water in the form of ice, and it's believed that there is a vast interior liquid water ocean within the moon just beneath the surface. The ultimate goal of Dragonfly is to hopefully discover any signs of life on Titan after it finally arrives seven years after first launching in 2034. But the unique, unmanned missions don't stop there. The European Space Agency, or ESA, has as their very own plan to launch a mission to another set of important moons around Jupiter, cleverly codenamed JUICE, or Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Set to launch just next year in 2023, JUICE will be studying three of the four Galilean moons orbiting Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. Similar to Titan, these three moons are each believed to have liquid oceans of water beneath their surface, making them all potentially habitable for life. By 2031, the probe will reach Jupiter, and over the next year, it will fly by Europa twice and Callisto multiple times before finally entering into orbit around the moon Ganymede for a close-up scientific mission, becoming the first spacecraft to ever orbit a moon other than Earth's own. There, the probe will perform a topographical mapping of Ganymede's surface, and study the characteristics of the oceanic layers beneath the surface. After three years of busy scientific exploration, the probe is planned to finally end its mission by deorbiting and crashing into Ganymede's surface, laying itself to rest in the name of science. So, ultimately, there's a lot to look forward to over the next decade of space exploration. From multiple brand new space stations, to returning back to the moon again after half a century, and to humanity setting foot on the first other planet besides our own, the decade ahead is set to become the brightest and the boldest of any era in human exploration thus far. The machines that build all of the parts for the spacecraft that make all of this exploration possible have to produce the parts with incredibly tight tolerances. If any of the parts aren't produced properly, they could end up failing or not operate as intended. And when some of these machines take years to get to their destination, cost billions of dollars, or have human lives at stake, the consequences for failure are absolute. And so the manufacturing process that builds them must be of the highest order. 
And interestingly, the sponsor of this video, Henson Shaving, actually uses the same aerospace machines that produce parts for the ISS and Mars rovers to produce their razors. Why? Well, because it turns out that if a razor can be reproduced to the exact same specifications every time, it greatly reduces chatter and increases the support of the blade. The more that the razor's blade is exposed, the more that it can bend and flex, which is the primary cause of rash nicking the skin and itchiness. On the other hand, by manufacturing their razors with aerospace machines, Henson's razors only expose the blade by 27 microns, or 0.0015 inches. When I used one, I was genuinely really impressed by how smooth of a shave it gave me, and I never really felt much tugging. Their razor also uses simple, recyclable blades, and since they're really cheap, once you have the razor, replacing the blades will only cost a few dollars a year. I really recommend checking out their website by clicking the button that's here on screen right now, or by following the link that's down in the description below. And best of all, the first 100 people to do so will get 100 free blades along with their purchase, which will last you a really long time. And, as always, thank you so much for watching.